So this is the World War I oil scarcity syndrome, and I call it to your attention uh, because uh, of its similarities to what uh, came afterwards. So uh, in 19, uh, around 1908, these uh, scarcity forecasts begin from the U.S. Geological Service. So on the, this, the bottom line here is simply a uh, schematic idea of what follows what, which is peak oil forecasts, uh, interventions in the domestic economy, uh, followed by a, a foreign intervention, this being the Red Line Agreement. So what specifically happens? We have in 1908 the scarcity forecasts. Uh, b even before World War I, uh, there's a very short occupation, military occupation of Veracruz by the U.S. Navy and Marines. This lasts for about three weeks. Um, the idea w really was to bring order. It, this wasn't an invasion to secure oil. There was um, quite a bit of Western capital at risk, uh, but the object was not to take over the oil supply. Uh, what shocked President Wilson was that 88 uh, sailors and Marines were killed, and uh, Mexicans, even the Mexican faction who had wanted the U.S. to come in, was now clamoring uh, for, to, for the U.S. to get out as soon as possible. So almost everything that might have been learned about U.S. intervention in a foreign country in which all uh, it was involved uh, could have been learned from this. So Wilson, President Wilson had a very hard time understanding uh, that how his good of intentions could have gone so wrong. He was genuine in his letters. He reveals genuine uh, wound. Uh, that's something that it, in which he had wanted to do good had ended up uh, with. Uh, so I mean, it wasn't just Americans who died. Many more Mexicans were killed. So World War uh, One. World War One begins, and the U.S. Uh, we have a, a massive uh, oil price spike uh, that begins, uh, fueled not just by war demand, but by the popularity of the automobile. Uh, we have a, a, a huge amount of demand growth. And we also have shortages beginning to appear because the uh, demand growth increment is so large. The U.S. is now supporting the war effort in uh, Western Europe. Price controls lead to something called the Lever Act, which I'll wager that none of you have heard of. The Lever Act basically gave the, the president the authority uh, to seize goods for the war effort should he need them. Uh, oil price uh, exceeded what the war and Navy departments felt was fair, so the oil that the, oil, that the federal government bought from the oil companies was not fully compensated. So there was a, there was a market price which consumers would pay uh, and a, a, a sort of a a shadow price, if you will, that government paid on the basis of what government decided that oil was was worth. This would this was followed by informal but very effective uh, uh, steel price controls. There was a, quite a monopoly in steel uh, at the time. Uh, rail transportation was controlled to support the war effort. Uh, a huge spread develops between the uh, mid-continent oil, that's oil that's produced around here, uh, and eastern oil. Uh, because of the, transpor the transportation bottlenecks. This, uh, this price spread might have indicated uh, maybe a rail transportation problem. Instead, to, particularly to the Navy Department, it indicated either monopoly, monopoly profit taking um, and an even more acute need to get foreign oil. So we had uh, basically domestic policies exacerbating what was uh, uh, quite a demand shock. President Wilson makes his declaration that um, we've obviously, since we're at domestic peak, this price spike is taken as a confirmation of uh, earlier peak oil forecasts. The Navy in night to war ends and the prices remain high. They go down briefly and then they go up even more. The uh, Secretary of the uh, Navy authorizes uh, Navy and Marine Corps elements in California to be, begin physically seizing oil because the oil companies no longer um, are, are willing to sell it, uh, or they can basically no longer afford to sell it at the spread, at the price that the government is willing to, to, to pay. So it's kind of an unknown uh, chapter in American uh, uh, oil history, but, but its importance is that, that under conditions of, of perceived or temporary scarcity, I should say, the scarcity was real, um, uh, willing government inter willingness to intervene is very high. So we have the um, Ranger Field comes to market in 1919. Uh, the Seminole find uh, 
nearby in 1924. We have a price collapse. That's not enough to uh, restrain uh, the federal government from creating a fuel oil conservation board to concern it, that concerned itself with future supply. So, and the uh, head of that fuel conservation board was the very USGS geologist whose prediction in uh, 1908 was that by 1935, the last US oil barrel would have been produced. So being wrong was not a disqualification uh, for uh, a very high office uh, nor was the coincidence of this, this, this massive new find uh, in basically 1924 and the Fuel Conservation Board uh, uh, created at the same time. We have a call for tariffs uh, by uh, domestic producers who, um, I mean, to protect themselves from themselves in this case, um, followed by the Red Line Agreement whose purpose uh, had been this foreign oil that we must have, uh, its effect is going to be uh, uh, the, uh, to help in the formation of a cartel to keep that foreign oil from market, or at least to keep it in European markets where it couldn't uh, damage U.S. price. And here's World War II. It's quite a different situation in that you see price, oil prices falling. If you'll recall, and you probably can't since I've flashed so many arrows and uh, curves at you, uh, commodity prices are still rising steeply, all right? So the federal government, the, the government has been politically been much more willing and able to control oil price. So in 1941, we have oil price controls uh, imposed. I'm sorry, here we are. So this is 1941. Uh, at this point, three-fifths of the uh, U.S. oil industry is losing money. Uh, because of the long uh, price glut from uh, the 19, off the 19, 19, 19, 20 peak. So the only uh, folks who are still exploring and uh, still looking are larger companies. Their costs are rising because all other commodity prices uh, are rising, uh, and their, but their ability uh, to borrow is uh, quite constrained because basically banks want to be uh, sure that they can, their debt can be retired from the revenue stream, which is no longer true at controlled price. So price begins to, f price begins to fall. Um, at the same time, uh, we also have a massive diversion of the tanker fleet to supply Britain. This is before the, um, this is beginning in 1941. Uh, this calls even more, um, uh, Venezuelan oil uh, into the U.S. where uh, something like three-fifths of the tankers that sail from Venezuela in this period uh, on their way to uh, Europe and the United States are, are sunk. So we actually have demand destruction during World War II, which we'd never see in World War I and we don't see again during the Vietnam War, which is the next great version of this uh, oil price uh, scarcity syndrome. So the Petroleum Reserves Corporation is, preser is uh, proposed in 1943 by the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, he gets President Roosevelt to sign on to this, and its purpose is to get the federal government into the de development business in the Middle East. So one way or another, the U.S. is going to become kind of like uh, British Petroleum, what was then um, uh, Anglo-Persian oil, and be formally in the business. So keep in mind that Commodity prices are going up here. World War II ends. Price begins to rise, partially because some of these same transportation problems that we alluded to. Price controls are still in place. Uh, we have a very cold winter. And what I call the, right after World War II, the sentiment theory of oil supply is formally embraced by both the State Department and the Department of War and the Department of the Navy, and that is that the U.S. must be liked. There must be affection uh, between the supplier uh, and the United States in order for oil to flow, uh, whether it's from Mexico or from Arabia. So under the sentiment theory, uh, the establishment of Israel was something that was greatly dreaded uh, both inside the State Department and, uh, and many uh, among many high military officers, that the, the U.S. W uh, could endanger its oil supply by supporting Israel, which is what uh, President Truman proceeded to do. Now, uh, the establishment of Israel was uh, a, a great insult to uh, 
uh, Muslim and to uh, Arab peoples. Uh, it remains so today, of course. But what's important for uh, uh, my purpose is not the goodness or badness of that decision, but that oil continued to flow. That the sentiment didn't matter much uh, because the sellers uh, had needs, even though the sellers, as, as uh, Dr. Al-Haji pointed out, uh, the, the beneficiaries of, of most of this oil at this time were still the Western companies. So some interesting things begin to happen after World War II, and that is that Mexico, which had had a revolution in uh, uh, 1917 and had nationalized oil in 1938, uh, came back to the United States in 1947 saying, geez, we, uh, we, we've, we, we haven't enjoyed any foreign investment because we've kept it out. Uh, we'd, we'd like to build an oil refinery uh, and, and so we can send some of our oil to you. Uh, and this idea was vehemently opposed in the State Department, which worried that if the U.S. Were to, were to make this loan, that it would, it would send a signal to Venezuela and then perhaps Arabia that it would be an okay thing to nationalize oil. So the Venezuelans had had uh, uh, more than a decade to look at what had happened to the Mexican oil industry, which was that it went straight downhill uh, after nationalization in terms of production. The Venezuelans basically asked for and got the 50-50 deal, which is uh, now rather famous, in which the, uh, the, the majors, the Western companies, agreed to a much more favorable, uh, uh, much more favorable divide of the profits from the oil production. The Mexico refinery should have made perfect sense from a strategic perspective since the uh, uh, the having uh, or the access to Persian Gulf oil, uh, Arabian Gulf oil, was thought to be of such high importance. Yet, this n the nearest source we had was one that was felt to somehow would endanger um, supplies somewhere else. So, over President Truman's vehement objections, and I, I found a classified document in which President, in which President Truman overwrites a State Department. Uh, uh, advice to well, we, we certain that we certainly cannot give this loan to Mexico because it will result in nationalization in Venezuela. Uh, so President Truman didn't believe this. Somehow the State Department prevailed, and Mexico gave up this loan application. So what happens next is the Iran coup, a seemingly uh, a seeming to controvert completely the sentiment theory of oil supply. So President Truman believed in 1952 that Iranian oil was going to flow, as I mentioned earlier, whether or not the Iranians had a 50-50 deal or whether they nationalized oil. It shouldn't make a difference to the U.S., he thought. And President uh, Eisenhower believed completely differently, and we had the coup. So this scare, I'm going to skip in the interest of time this same sequence of events during the Vietnam War, but we did have price controls. We had a steep generalized uh, increase in commodity prices. It was preceded by growth in the money supply. Uh, 